Okay, this is lesson two. We began this lesson today um, at the end of class talking about the typology of law. We'll briefly review that, then we'll finish that, and we'll get into a little bit of terminology. Terminology is quite a short part of the lesson. Uh, calling this Canon Law 1 and semi-exile as a holdover from last semester after our transition Thanks to COVID, uh, we called our online class Canon Law in Exile. We're only in semi-exile this semester, so we're um, in semi-exile. Okay, <clears throat> we started with Thomas's preliminary definition of law, and this is from the first part of the second part of the Summa, Question 90, Article 1. Thomas starts with this definition but he's going to modify it. Law, he says, is a rule and measure of acts whereby man is induced to act or is restrained from acting. Then he goes on to say that lex, the word for law, lex is derived from legare, to bind, because a law binds a person. Um, and then he says, the rule and measure of human acts is the reason, which is the first principle of human acts. And those are the things we discussed today, that law is a rule, it induces us to act, that is, it doesn't just persuade us, but it does address our reason. It doesn't literally, physically compel us either. It's kind of in the middle of stopping at a mere suggestion and actually physically compelling us. It's it's addressed to our, our reason. Um, <clears throat> and then he discusses several principles that are going to lead to his development of his classical definition of law. The first one is the common good. And um, and what what he really means here is the relationship to happiness, but the, the happiness of the community. Um, and if you're, common good is a very important principle. It, uh, two popes that really emphasized it are Pius XII, um, who was pope from World War II till about 20 years later, from 39 to 58, and then his successor, John XXIII, uh, Pope for five years, for the next five years. They both um, emphasize the common good quite a lot. If you want a good definition of it, uh, you can find it in the Catechism or also in Gaudium et Spes. Both paragraphs 26 and 74 of Gaudium et Spes talk about it. And the real definition of the common good is the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. It can be hard to remember all the pieces of that definition. Um, at least keep in mind that the common good is what is geared to the ultimate <clears throat> human fulfillment of, uh, of people, both as individuals and, uh, and as groups. Now, uh, we talked today when Thomas is going to put common good into his definition of law, we asked, what's the opposite of that? And one of you said, that, well, the opposite would be the individual good. Exactly right. We don't, um, we don't uh, want to have a law only for the good of some private person. Um, and that, you could actually call that, in some instances, at least corruption, if that's what your laws are, if your laws are um, really just for the uh, private good, of, for the good of an individual person, possibly even tyranny, if the whole regime is operated only for the sake of one person's or one small group's uh, good, uh, that would really, that could really be, or at least tend to be, a tyrannical regime. Um, okay, good. And, and um, uh, this is why the lawgiver is so important. Is the person legitimately, legitimately in a position to, uh, to, enact, to enact laws? Uh, does he actually have the authority? And 
Thomas asks another question <clears throat> about what's called a very key issue called promulgation. And um, let me give you this word here. Here's our word promulgation. Don't worry about what's below it for right now. Just, just that word promulgation. A law, what Thomas is going to say in his classical definition is that the law has to be promulgated. What does that mean? In the simplest sense, it means the law has to be made known. A very close synonym to promulgation would be publication. The law has to be published so that people people know what they're being expected to do, what the law is imposing on them. Publication doesn't quite capture the whole idea of promulgation, though. That's a big part of it, the notice, putting people on notice. But also, people need not only to know about this enactment, they also need to know that it's going to be enforced as law. That's going to be another part of promulgation. And um, there's usually going to be a particular way that laws are promulgated. For instance, in the um, with laws of the U.S. Congress, I think they're promulgated either in the Federal Register or the Congressional Record, probably the Federal Register. Um, and in the church, when the universal church promulgates laws, they are, we have them in the, ap, the Acta Apostolica Sadis. Um, if we go on our tour of the library of the canonical holdings there, you'll see the Acta, and they're usually in black volumes, black leather-bound volumes, and it's all the official pronouncements of the Pope, uh, but also universal laws would be there, apostolic constitutions, modu proprios, etc. What about, what about particular law? What's particular law? Particular law is less than universal law, so we usually mean the law of a diocese, but it could be a law of another community too, like a religious community. It could be the particular law of the Carmelites or or the 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 Jesuits or or whomever. Let's for right now. Let's just talk about diocesan laws. Uh, <clears throat> method of promulgation will be different there, uh, and it'll be different among dioceses. I think Woodall suggests that. There may be a clergy bulletin that uh, laws are promulgated in. Also, I think in the U.S., remember, Woodall is British, so he's he's writing from a British perspective. In the U.S., um, I think they probably, diocesan laws would be promulgated in the uh, diocesan newspaper. So we'll put that up there. Promulgation for universal law in the AAS, Acta Apostolica Sedis, for particular diocesan law. It's going to vary uh, probably in a diocesan newspaper here or in Britain, a clergy bulletin. Um, there aren't a lot of diocesan laws, though. Most bishops, a bishop is a lawgiver, but most bishops do not exercise that power very, very often. Okay, why is promulgation necessary? Um at least two main reasons. One is, if I'm the lawgiver, if I'm a responsible lawgiver, uh, I enacted this law, I want it to take effect so that the law can achieve its purpose. I have to tell people, if I'm lowering the speed limit for the purpose of safety, well, I need to tell people I'm lowering the speed limit so that this my law will achieve its purpose. It will actually keep people safe. It's not enough that I've just enacted a law. I need to promulgate it, to publish it, make it known, and make it known as law so that it will achieve its purpose. That's one reason, but also for the reason of fairness uh, and justice. I need to tell the people who are responsible for following the law in fairness to them it's, I can't stop them for speeding, uh, for driving 35 miles an hour when the, when the uh, speed limit used to be 50. I can't just stop them for going, uh, for going too fast unless they're put 
on notice unless the law is published. In the case of a speeding law, it's not only going to be published, the speed limit is actually going to be posted right there on the, on the road as well. Um, so promulgation, very important for um, especially the rights of someone who's accused of not following the law. Okay, now that we've got these other pieces in order, we get Thomas's uh, classical definition of law. We're still in question 90 of the first part of the second part of the Summa. Now we're in Article 4. After he talks about the lawgiver, the common good promulgation, then he builds up to the great crescendo of his classical definition and justly called classical definition of, of law. A law is nothing other, he tells us, than an ordinance of reason. That is, it's a reasonable ordinance. What's an ordinance? Well, it's an order. I'm telling you to do or not to do something, or Congress, or the Indiana State Legislature is telling you to do this or not do that. Um, but it's an ordinance of reason. It's a reasonable law. There's some, there's some legitimate reason for it. Um, it's not um, just you have to hop to work. To, to get to work, you have to go to work to go to work by hopping there on one leg. Not really a reasonable requirement. No, no good state reason to require you to hop on one leg to get to work, um, though it might make life more interesting. Um, so an ordinance of reason for the common good, or made, enacted for the common good, um, it's both reasonable and it's going to promote something that's for the good of the community, and it's made by the person who has care of the community. Now, Thomas talks about by the person. He's thinking of a, an individual. Um, of course, political science has progressed since Thomas, so now we're usually going to think of a legislature, a legislative body, and even possibly needing the agreement of the executive, the governor, or the president in a lot of countries. So primarily the legislature, the lawmaking body, but even the executive, the enforcer of the laws, may need to approve the law as, as well, depending on the constitution of whatever state or country we're talking about. And as we said, promulgated. So this is a very famous definition. You may even run into people who remember learning this in uh, college or if they had a particularly good high school, um, uh, high school formation even there. So we've got an ordinance of reason for the common good made by him who has care of the community and promulgated. That's it. Very concise, very economic uh, definition of what it means to be a law. Um, again, I just cannot tell you how valuable this definition is. And if you have Peter Kreeft's book, Summa of the Summa, I know you don't all, but Kreeft has a footnote there where he um, he says, well, when by, by holding up Thomas's elements, these five elements, by holding up these elements, they tell us not only what a law is, what what we need to have a good, legitimate law, but the opposite. It tells us how a law can crash and burn, how there can be a problem with a law. What, what can the problems be? An ordinance. Maybe it's not an ordinance. We have This is a problem we have in the church where um, a diocese may have guidelines or a policy about a certain issue, is that the same as a law? It's hard to say because an ordinance is going to make clear that it's law. Guidelines and policies, it's not always clear. That's why canonists really do not like the trend that we see in a lot of the uh, church life in America to um, enact policies and guidelines rather than law. It would be clearer if when we wanted something to be binding, we made it a law for the diocese. So one is, maybe it's not an ordinance at all. Maybe it's only a strong suggestion. An ordinance of reason. could be un It could be unreasonable. If it's unreasonable, 
that's going to be a problem with it even qualifying as a law. And it may not be for the common good. It may be something that destroys the common good, uh, something that harms people instead of instead of helps people. We talked about the a one-child policy. Um, don't want to pick only on that example, but it's such a famous one, well-known and um, problematic, that uh, it's it serves as a good example. But we could think of other of other examples too. Um, and again. Has the law been made by the legitimate uh, lawgiver, the one who has care of the community, the one who, if that means election, it's going to mean election in most countries, uh, the one who's legitimately elected, um, not the one who bribed his way into office, not the one who stole the election, not the one who was voted out but refuses to leave, but the legitimately elected person, and again, promulgated. Maybe everything's great about this law. It's the wisest, most wonderful, most needed law in all of Spain, but it hasn't been made known to the people. Um, so the people can't, can't follow it. So as Kraft nicely points out, Thomas at the same time is showing us not only what a law needs, but even how a law or an attempted law can go wrong. Okay, and then uh, in, you just, uh, it's just hard to praise Thomas enough in general. I think, um, you know, we know he's the, uh, the often considered the patron of schools, could very easily be the patron of many, many other things. Uh, those of you who've used Survey Pinker's uh, Moral Theology book with Dr. Schemenauer uh, may have seen how Pinker's has this enormous regard for Thomas. In fact, even though um, I believe... I believe Alphonsus Liguori is the patron saint of moral theologians. It's quite clear from Pinker's book that if it were up to Pinker's, the patron saint of, of uh, moral theologians would probably be Thomas Aquinas. We could also say Thomas has done an immense amount for, for the law, more than, more than most lawyers have done. Uh, it could certainly be a... Uh, be a uh, patron for for law or for lawyers or legal legal studies, but this one particular problem we talked about today is legal positivism. And what's interesting is it's a very harmful theory, and it's one that comes along uh, really after Thomas by several centuries. But Thomas's theory is so vigorous that he provides. Uh, solutions to problems that uh, weren't even weren't even known in his own day. So our difficulty with there are different kinds of positivism. So we'll talk very briefly about these other two. Um, and you'll you'll just it'll it'll give you a sense of what positivism positivism is in general. But we're concerned especially with legal positivism. What that means is that the idea that to see whether a law is valid we don't look at we don't take Thomas's view. We look only to see if proper procedures were followed. Was the person legitimately in office? Were the procedures followed? Did the legislature vote it? If the governor needs to sign it, did he sign it? And that's the end. It's only the procedure that's looked at, not the substance. Thomas looks at procedure. Um, he says, "Is it?" Uh, who has made it? Has it been promulgated? Is the person who has made it legitimately in office? But Thomas, especially in parts two and three, is going to say that's not enough. We can't just look at the procedure. We have to look at is this a reasonable law? Is it made for the good of the people? So you see, pos legal positivism is only saying does it have the essentially the form of the law, in a way. Um, we'll just mention scientific and logical positivism. Scientific positivism is associated often with Auguste Comte, and what Comte said was that only scientific knowledge 
is valid. No other knowledge is valid. So only if you can sort of prove it by the scientific method, that's the only knowledge that counts. So what we do so much of here, theology um, and uh, the type of knowledge that does not come from experiments or from data or observing data, Comte would not consider that real knowledge. It has to come only through scientific means. So that's scientific positivism. And you can see something similar there. There's a narrowing, a constricting of what we are admitting to be called law, what we're admitting to be called um, to be called knowledge. Well, well, it's interesting. With law, it's sort of broadening by saying, but it's a narrowing of the criteria. It's broadening by saying anything that follows the procedures. In science, it's more of a narrow, it's also narrowing the criteria, but also narrowing what counts as knowledge. So it's saying only something based on data, scientific observation, not things based on um, other modes of knowledge. We're especially concerned with revelation as a mode of knowledge, but you could have other things too. Intuition, uh, maybe um, literature, emotional knowledge, things, things like that. Um, and another brand, logical positivism. What does that mean? That would say that only, it's similar to scientific positivism. Only verifiable statements make sense. Nothing, nothing else really makes sense um, other than a verifiable statement. So it has so so that means only fact statements, only verifiable fact statements uh, are meaningful. Um, so you can see what's being crossed out. Um, anything to do with what we would call movements of the human spirit. Uh, that would not be considered um, intelligible even to a logical positivist. Um, so you kind of see what these three have in common, why they're all called positivism. We're concerned with legal positivism here because, as we said, these laws promoting abortion, allowing abortion, um, uh, one-child policy, uh, permitting permitting slavery, permitting all kinds, just denying human rights in any number of different ways, these kinds of laws. Um, if you're a legal positivist, you have no objection to them if they've been passed through appropriate procedures. You really can't you really can't argue against them unless you've got you've got Thomas's deep, rich, profound view of what is needed to call something a law, or m maybe others have theories too. But uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know anyone who's topped Thomas's. Um, so, and as you can see, legal positivism is a it's a threat in our time because it's such a minimal thing. When there's a scandal or anything like that, really, all we care about these days is was the law broken, and we could. You could go your whole life without breaking the law and still be a pretty terrible person. But if you're a legal positivist, your 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 focus is rather narrower, certainly narrower than than what a uh, more traditionally Christian, tr even a traditionally uh, uh, broadly speaking humanistic understanding, I think, would be. Um, so so. Thomas is going to show us how we can analyze these laws that seem so problematic and uh, is going to give us more criteria to look at so that we can judge them and come to a, a good, healthy conclusion about them. Okay, um, that's the end of question 90. Really one of our, one of our keys. Now we're going to go on to question 91. And this is where Thomas talks about the different kinds of law. And the first one he talks about, this is question 91, article 1, is eternal law. It's a little bit complicated, but here's what he says. A law is nothing else but a dictate of practical reason emanating from a ruler who governs a perfect community. Now it is evident, granted that the world is ruled by divine providence, 
that the whole community of the universe is governed by divine reason. Wherefore, the very idea of the government of things in God, the ruler of the universe, has the nature of a law. And since the divine reason's conception of things is not subject to time, but is eternal, therefore it is that this kind of law must be called eternal. Uh, pretty much a, a big mouthful there. Um, it could read it slower. It might be a little more manageable. But what's he? what is he saying? Um, a, a couple of things. One is he's saying that everything is subject to divine providence and that God governs, governs all things, and that his government, his government of all the things in the universe is like a law or it has the nature of a law. What does he mean by that? Um, it means uh, in perfect Thomistic fashion, you know, avoid. Um, what would... What are the other options if, with it not, besides being a law? Um, one would be that things could just be chaos. Nothing means anything. There's no order. There's no rhyme or reason. You can't figure it out. You can't learn anything. It's just you're just being bombarded by things that happen. Not Thomas's view. When Thomas says uh, it's like a law, it has the nature of a law about it. One thing he's saying is that God's government of the whole universe has an order to it. It's not just chaos. But what else is Thomas saying? Not just that um, it's not chaos, uh, but that it's ordered, but it's ordered in a reasonable way. It's, it's ordered according to divine reason, according to divine wisdom. It's not tyrannical. This is not a tyrannical uh, world. We're not created the things aren't created to be um uh to be robots serving purposes other than their own everything in the universe has its own purpose we're created out of mercy itself so we're by saying there's a a government of all things in god we're avoiding both the the poles of chaos and of and of what we might call a divine tyranny, um, which you know you could see in some of the some of the Near Eastern um, creation stories, where you see where you see uh, some of the the gods that are depicted in the Near East, the ancient Near East. I'm talking about um, really really seeming sometimes to border on kind of tyrannical views. Um, so how do we encapsulate what is eternal law? I'm going to give you my my two cents, the way I kind of try to get it down into a few words. Um, you could use Thomas's words exactly and say maybe the idea of the government of things in God is eternal law. That would be fine, or God's government of all things. Um, here's, here's what... Now this is... Um, this is kind of my rephrasing of Thomas a bit. So I'm going to say eternal law, and I, I hope I'm being true to Thomas. If you disagree, please let me know. We will have a discussion session on this, but it's important to um, important to be true to, to, uh, to and fair to the authors that we're reading. The wisdom of God directing all things to their proper ends or purposes, that that's what eternal law is, this order, and even beauty, harmony, I mean, harmony is a good word, um, of God directing all things providentially, caring for his wisdom and his reason, uh, directing, bringing along all things to their proper ends purposes, fulfillment, consummation, that that would be one way to think of eternal law. And I think it's pretty true to Thomas here, but again, I'll be interested in your in your view. Um, okay, then we move on to natural law. What is natural law? And um, Thomas starts out by quoting the famous passage from Romans 2, where Paul says that the Gentiles, even the Gentiles who don't have the law of Moses, um, they are a law to themselves. 
um, they have a law written on their hearts, at least the conscientious ones, or the ones willing to listen, willing to direct themselves inward to that to that interior law. Um, so he so Thomas starts out when Gentile well, this is Paul really, when Gentiles who have not the law do by nature what the law requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, um, etc. And you can read the rest yourself. Um, very interesting. If we have the... Why do we need both the Mosaic law and the natural law? If we've got the law of Moses, why can't everybody just come to the law of Moses? Uh, since the law of Moses does indeed repeat in large measure the natural law. Uh, and Thomas gives us excellent answers here. One thing is that human judgment is uncertain. Yes, we do have the law written on our hearts. We can make mistakes about what that law says. We can interpret it incorrectly. How do we do that? Uh, we can do that for a number of reasons. One of our big problems is that we can sometimes interpret things more to our advantage or more to what we want the answer to be than to what it really is or what it really seems to be. Um, C.S. Lewis says, the uh, the moral law is easy to know but hard to follow. Uh, sounds like Thomas agrees with that, but he might say it might even be a little bit easy, a little bit hard to to know sometimes too. Um, and what also are we subject to ignorance, indifference, bad habits. All of things can these things can compromise our ability to really understand uh, understand the natural law. But then um, so. If you want to say what the natural law is, a it's fine to use Paul's Paul's expression, the law written on the human heart. Um, really hard to top that. You don't don't need to top that. But we need to talk about Thomas too. He's already talked about the eternal law, the wisdom of God running through all things. He said, "Well, this so all things partake of the eternal law." but none more so than man, because man is the rational creature. So he partakes of the eternal law in a, an especially um, excellent way, and that is what natural law is, the rational creature, man's participation in the eternal law. And the eternal law's participation, or it's running through, running through man. Uh, so we've got in Article 2, um, all things partake somewhat of the eternal law. Now, among all others, the rational creature is subject to divine providence in the most excellent way, insofar as it partakes of a share of providence by being provident for itself and for others. So man has to exer not, just, not just be a subject of divine providence, but he has to show providence, planning ahead and exercising reason in his own life for himself and for other people. Um, wherefore it, the rational creature, man, has a share of the eternal reason, whereby it has a natural inclination to its proper act and end, and this participation of the eternal law in the rational creature is called the natural law. It is therefore evident that the natural law is nothing else than the rational creature's participation of the eternal law. He says of, I don't know why we don't say in, but I think it's a pretty much the same thing. Um, so he kind of describes it both ways, either the eternal law participating not only in all created things, but especially in the rational creature man, and man having a part of eternal reason, man participating in the, uh, in the, uh, the, eternal, the eternal law. So what's very helpful about Thomas's definition is um, that it, one thing is it kind of tells us why natural law is called natural. And there are at least two reasons. One is that it's, it, 
it's part of human nature. It's in human nature, really, to to say what the natural law requires is to say, in a lot of ways, what man himself requires. It's to say something about man as a being. Um, so it's in our nature. Knowing natural law means knowing ourselves, but it's also known by human nature. We're understanding our nature, but our own nature helps us to understand our nature. So nature is what we're seeking, what we want to understand, but fortunately our nature also helps us to do that. Um, and that should, should make clear to us that natural law is not a thing outside of ourselves. It's not a big book of rules that the Lord drops on our head and says, follow these. Natural law is is in us. It's running all through us. Uh, so unfortunately, you see some really excellent authors who are much less excellent when they talk about the natural law. And two I'll mention, uh, I hate to do this because they're such great authors, but they're not great on this subject. Um, G.K. Chesterton and Dorothy Sayers, both worth reading. Um, I'm thinking of Chesterton's Orthodoxy and of Sayers' The Mind of the Maker. Two wonderful books, both worth reading. Go out and get them today. Read them both before you go to sleep. Uh, but be careful about what they say about natural law, What how they kind of treat natural law often is as something outside. They'll more like mathematics or gravity, more like kind of the laws of the universe, maybe, maybe physical laws. Not Thomas's idea. Thomas says this is human nature um, and known by human nature. An author in that same group, but who's better, is uh, C.S. Lewis. He talks about natural law. He calls it the Tao, uh, T-A-O, the Tao. Um, and he's, he's, he's better at seeing the human implications of it. He doesn't really define it the way that Thomas does, um, but you can tell, and I'm thinking of his work, The Abolition of Man, you can tell by reading that that he's, uh, He's on the he's on the right path at least. Okay, um, what's our next type of law? The next one that Thomas talks about is divine law, and when Thomas talks about divine law, he means law that comes to us from special revelation, um, not law that we could figure out um, by understanding our human nature. Uh, but that we couldn't know about unless we had divine revelation. For instance, we can come to a knowledge that there is a God just through our natural abilities. Um, but knowing that Peter is to be head of the church, knowing that the successors of the apostles are to rule the church, you can't sit on any mountaintop and figure that out. You can only know that if the Lord reveals it. So where, where there's law contained in uh, Revelation, that's what Thomas is calling divine law. Um, now, I'm going to suggest that, so here's a, uh, I'm going to suggest a little kind of uh, maybe a slight difference in terminology. We could, what Thomas calls divine law in Article 4 of Question 91, we also could call divine positive law. Positive, we've used positive in a pretty negative sense, uh, but um, there's a positive. What positive means is what is proposed, what is posited. Um, and it's not just us as humans who can posit or propose or enact a law, but the Lord can do that too. And so... When he does that through revelation, we could call that, we could be a little more specific and call that divine positive law. Um, and then we might have a reason to do that. So, And if we did that, another thing we could think about, do we know of any other divine law? Um, well, we do. We just talked about it. Natural law. We could say, we could say eternal, but let's 
call talk about net we're especially concerned with natural law because it concerns man so what thomas calls natural law uh, we also could call divine natural law and what this is the reason we might adopt these terminologies especially the top one calling divine law divine positive law is it's going to remind us that when we have divine law we have two different types of it um divine natural law the law that god promulgates on our hearts that he writes into his creation of us uh, but also another kind of law positive law that he doesn't put in our nature but tells us about through revelation so um i usually will probably just say natural law but uh for divine law what Thomas calls divine law coming from revelation, um, I very often will say divine positive law. You can do, you can do either one. You can you can stick with Thomas's terminology, of course, always a safe thing to do, and just call it divine law. Or you can you can go along with me and say divine divine positive law. Okay, some other distinctions we could make. There's also such a thing as human law. What's the difference between human law and divine law? Uh, pretty clear, the origin. If it originates in God, it's divine law. If it originates in man, it is, uh, it is human law. When we, um, we have already said we could make distinctions within divine law between these two, especially uh, natural law and divine positive law. Um, let's see. Uh, other examples of divine positive law, if you want them, we talked about putting Peter at the head of the church, governing the church by the successors of the apostles, with the binding and loosing part. The Great Commission, we talked about that the other day, go and baptize all nations. That's That really has legal significance, not only, it's not only inspiring, not only spiritual, not only theological, but it's going to have legal significance for us. As we saw in our first class, uh, that was going to be one of our very strong bases for for um, suggesting that the Williams family had been treated uh, had been treated poorly. Um, all human law is positive law, unless it unless it repeats divine law or natural law. For instance, marriage law. Marriage law says the only people eligible for, to be married are one man and one woman. That's the only possible marriage. Well, that's that's uh, that's human law, but it's actually repeating natural law. So, um, so that would be an example where, in a sense, the human law is somewhat more than human law. Um, what it's what it's actually doing is, of course, the human law can't really add to the natural law. It's really repeating it. If the human law is repealed, and we've seen this, unfortunately, in a lot of places where the marriage law has changed and that law that coincided with natural law has been um, has been amended uh, to recognize as marriage things that are not truly marriages, still the divine law is in force. The human law may attempt to repeal divine law, but it cannot actually do that. Um, but as we say, human law may sometimes repeat divine law, some criminal law. As you can see, criminalizing murder obviously really tracks our, our, uh, our mosaic law even. Um, and, uh, also, our our first kind of type of uh, human law is civil law or secular law, but our second type is canon law. Canon law presumably is human law. Most of canon law are human enactments. Again, like civil law, civil law can repeat the natural law. Canon law can repeat the natural law as it does when it truly says who may be married, but it also can um, repeat the divine law, for instance, when it says that marriage has been raised to the dignity of a sacrament. So we've got three things in canon law, at least. 
One is merely ecclesiastical law. That's going to be human law. Um, every parish has to have a finance council. That is not from divine law. That is not from natural law. That is a purely human law. So merely ecclesiastical law. Or we could also just call that human law. But it's just a, a law um, of utility, in, us, in essence. Also natural law. Again, we we had our example there with marriage, especially, and divine positive law, or what Thomas just calls divine law. And uh, you can see a lot of divine law in canon law because you have a lot of dealing with the Pope, a lot of dealing with uh, with the bishops. Uh, even there, though, we have both we have both human law and divine law. Um, we know the office of bishops, the office of the Pope. Um, the institution of the priesthood, the Eucharist, the sacraments, all come from the Lord, and they're all in the code. So that is divine law. But the particulars, as we said in the first class, how old you have to be to be a bishop? How long do you study to be a priest? When are you admitted to First Communion? That is that is human law. That is where the human law has to has to complete the divine law, so that we can say this is what's appropriate now in our in our time um, under our circumstances. This is how old a bishop should be. This is how long a priest should study. This is the time when a child uh, should receive the uh, the Eucharist for the first time. Um, okay. Uh, I believe that that oh okay we're almost done with our with our coverage of Thomas. The last question we had from Thomas is question ninety six, and this is on law and morality. We only have a couple of comments about this. Um, Thomas asks, "Do laws forbid all evils?" And he says that no, human laws they do not forbid all evils. Now, divine law does, right? I mean. We're not allowed to do any any evil under divine law, but human laws do not forbid all evils or all vices, but only the more grievous ones. Well, why not? Why not outlaw all the vices? A couple of reasons. One is that Thomas says men are at different levels of virtue, and um, not not all men live at the highest level of virtue. Um, again. Why not make them do so? Wouldn't we have a better world if we made them do so? And Thomas, very, both a great mind, but also a realistic mind, um, Thomas says, no, because law, as we said, is ordered to the common good. And, you know, maybe there would be benefits of bringing people to a higher level of virtue, uh, but that would be primarily for their individual good and forcing people to be virtuous is going to have um, very likely going to have negative consequences. So it says no law is ordered to the common good, not nearly as much to the individual good. So we're only addressing the most grievous vices because we're looking at uh, what is of most concern to the community. And then he asked this interesting question: Is it ever possible to act not against the law? but beside the law. Is there such a thing as acting beside the law? And so what you're doing, what he means by that is you're not really following the law, but you're not quite breaking it either. We might call it bending the law. And um, he, gives us, he gives us an example. So what he's really asking is, are there some situations where you have a good law, it's in place, it makes sense, but in a particular situation, it would lead to either an unjust result or an absurd result if you followed the law. For example, um, he gives the example of a city that's being besieged, so they order the gates to be shut at night. So that, that makes sense. That's a good law. But you have some defenders of the city who got caught outside the gates, and if you open the gates to them, you're breaking the law, but you want to open the gates because they want, they're want they coming in, they're the great defenders of the city. So of course, you act beside the law so that you can, in a sense, even achieve the purpose of the law. Another example, um, 
you've got a pond that has a no swimming sign and a city ordinance there, and uh, so you don't go swimming there. But you see someone drowning there, and you're like, boy, I wish I could save them, but I'd have to go swimming to save them, and um, I would be breaking the law. Well, obviously you should break the law. You are not break the law, but it, Thomas says, act beside it. Act in accordance with the ultimate intention of the law, but actually do what is is not not quite following the law, but really uh, seems to be contrary, or in Thomas's words, is really acting beside the law. I swim in to save the drowning person, um, but I'm doing that to achieve the purpose, the purpose of the no swimming sign posted at the at the uh, pond is to prevent people from drowning. So I'm helping achieve that purpose, even though in a on some level I seem to be breaking the law. Okay, that's the end of our typology lesson. Now we have just a couple of things we could say about terminology. Remember we said that um, you're going to be doing glossaries. Uh, these Some of these terms in this terminology part might be helpful to you for your glossaries. Thomas's definition of his classical definition of law, I think, really needs to be in your glossary. Um, again, you're, it's up to you, but it's, it's so great, it's so helpful. Um, very unlikely that you will not see that on one of our tests this semester. Uh, you're doing yourself a favor if you include it. I'll put it that way. Um, and these other terms I'm gonna about to give you, they're not so much to put in your glossary, though you can do that if you want to, um, but it's to just give some clarification on some terms that you uh, that you may see. Um, one of the the first set of terms are ones that we talked about in our first class. Uh, let's see, at least about some of them. And they are, let me kind of limit this here. Okay, legal and juridical. What's the difference between legal and juridical? Um, th they're, they're pretty close. They're pretty close. Juridical is used more commonly in the church. You just hear that word more often. Um, I do think it's a broader word, again, the root is use, the same root as justice, versus legal, the root is lex, more the like a, a specific law. So that's going to tip us off that there's uh, juridical is, is somewhat broader. So juridical, we're going to be um, thinking of not only specific laws, though that's a big part of it, but also justice, also the field of law uh, and the study of law, too. Um, so you could maybe say legal plus would be something like what it would mean to, to uh, describe uh, what, is, what is juridical. For example, when we say, when we say that, um, that uh, Jesus putting... Peter at the head of the church, that that, I mean, a canonist has no problem saying that that's part of divine law. Others might, others might, might say, boy, I don't know that that's a, a law. I don't really think of it as a law. Um, so they might not want to call it a legal statement, but they might say, but it, it would have juridical significance. If we have, say juridical is a category that uh, is very similar to what it means to be legal, but is somewhat, somewhat broader. So it would include things that at least in our um, kind of like maybe an Anglo-American context might not be called strictly legal, but they're, they're um, very similar uh, in a sense. So I, I, hope, I hope that's helpful. Uh, like I said, for a lot of purposes, 80, 90% of the time, it's not going to be a mistake to talk about juridical as uh, very close to legal. Just keep in mind it's a bit broader. And then, we have, then our next term is canonical. What does it mean to be canonical? And we have sort of two options. One, um, being canonical can just mean whatever's in the code. 
you break a law in the code, you've done something uncanonical. Uh, but as you know, we're studying canon law now, and we're studying things, as you saw in the syllabus today, a lot of things that are outside of the code, especially in penal law, but in other areas too. I mean, we're studying Thomas. This is outside of the code. So I just want, just want to alert you that canonical, some people when they say canonical or is this against canon law, are just going to mean strictly what do the specific canons of the code say, but other people are going to um, speak of church law more generally, or they'll, they're going to mean church law more generally when they speak of what is canonical or of canon law. Um, what would be the additional things included in church law besides what's in the code. A huge one, the biggest one, would probably be liturgical law. Um, what else? The law about canonization of saints. It's not in the code, but it's law. It's very important. The law about papal elections. Not in the code, um, but it's, but it's, uh, it's in a special constitution. Code does talk about papal elections, but it doesn't provide the whole procedure. That's in a separate constitution. So we will probably have tend to have more the broader idea that um, church law generally. But just keep in mind that you'll you'll sometimes hear canonical described as uh, meaning uh, specifically the canons and the code. Okay, then we get to this term civil law. Now, we've used civil law already, and the way we've used it, let me see if I can just raise up just enough, we've used civil law to mean secular law, as opposed to canon law. So it's human law, again, unless it repeats natural law, like canon law is human law, unless it repeats natural or divine law. Um, so we can speak of secular law as kind of put in opposition to maybe canon law um, and civil law in that sense. So we'll usually say somebody who has a regular law degree that's a civil lawyer as opposed to a canon lawyer. That's how we usually will use the term civil law. But there are other senses as well. Um, in Within the civil system, within the secular system, there's even a, say, within Indiana law, uh, there's another use of the word civil. For instance, if you if there's a lawsuit between two parties, um, Mr., uh, let's say, um, Mr., uh, Mr. Crabtree ran over Mr. Huber's dog. Um, well, that's a dispute between the two of them, and if there's going to be a lawsuit, there's going to be, it's a lawsuit between those two. It involves two private parties, so that would be a, that would be a civil matter, as opposed to what? As opposed to a criminal matter. A criminal matter is going to be the state against Huber, the state versus Crabtree, um, whereas civil is between two between two private parties. So that's within the secular system, within Indiana law, civil is going to mean essentially between between two private parties. Criminal, it's going to be the state against another another party. Someone committed a, a crime, um, not just a, a sort of a civil infraction, but committed a crime. Uh, I don't think you have to worry about that use of it. Just be aware that it's there. And here's another one that, again, it doesn't concern you too much, but you could run across it. Um, there's, in Europe at least, two main legal systems. One is the common law system from England, which also came to America, which is called common law. But on the continent, uh, the legal system is usually based on a code, like the church's legal system. And a code-based system is sometimes called a civil system, often capitalized in this case, though, uh, civil, civil law um, capitalized. So that's another use of it. So you could also say down here, um, civil could mean a code-based law 
versus common law. And when we say code-based, we mean especially the European continent, South America, a lot of other places too. Um, and when we say uh, common law, we mean mostly um, English-speaking countries and then also countries um, uh, that are uh, have a connection with English-speaking countries, India, Nigeria, Kenya, etc. Um, and uh, whereas other countries in Africa, um, Rwanda, Ivory Coast, are going to be closer to France, so closer to the continental system, closer to code-based uh, rather than, than common law. Um, okay, that's... That's civil law. Like I say, though, our first meaning, civil law as secular law, is going to be the one that's the most important for us. Okay, one more set of terms, and I think we can uh, close up shop. Uh, you see these, you see these terms used a lot: Rome, the Holy See, and the Vatican. Uh, what's the difference between them? Okay, um, you probably know this: uh, Rome. Is just Rome, the city. But we also, when we hear a um, when we hear a story about the church, often you'll get a uh, it will be reported in the sense of Rome has ruled such and such. Um, but you, you know this, you know this. The church is the Vatican City is entirely contained in Rome. Um, what those stories really mean when they say that Rome has ruled, Rome has has uh, has um, made this judgment or or something, or has has condemned this idea. Uh, what they really mean most of the time is the Holy See or the Apostolic See has made that judgment, um, and it's okay to substitute Rome. Sometimes you'll hear the Vatican. Replaced. The Vatican has made this judgment. Again, it's not the Vatican. The Vatican is a. The Vatican is the country. It's sort of the country, and the Pope is the head of it. He's the. He's like the, the the temporal head of, the the, the head of state, of the Vatican or of Vatican City, um, but the entity that's important for religious purposes is the Holy See. In fact, the, the um, ambassador, when, there's, when a country sends an ambassador to the Pope, he's not an ambassador to the Vatican. He's an ambassador to the Holy See. What does that mean? Literally means the seat, the seat of Peter, the apostolic see, the seat of the apostle. It's really, in a sense, an ambassador to the chair. Um, that the 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 Holy See really is um, in the most uh, probably the most proper sense. The Holy See is is the Pope, but the Holy See is also considered to be the curia. So if the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, for instance, in the responsum we've talked about with the Fatherhood case, um, if they've made a decision, uh, it's perfectly proper to say the Holy See made this decision. If the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Congregation for Divine Worship made a decision, it's fine to say the Holy See. Um, also Apostolic See. In canon law, you'll probably see Apostolic See more often than Holy See, but they they mean the same thing. Uh, the Vatican, you've got that. You know what that means. One other term, the Roman pontiff. You know who that is, obviously. It's the Pope. I only put up the term Roman pontiff here. You don't usually hear that term, uh, but it's all over the code. The code very often refers to the Pope as the Roman pontiff, and so we will do that sometimes, or even sometimes just call him the RP uh, if we're writing on a board. Okay, that's it. Again, so um, we've covered our, we've done a little review of what we covered in in uh, typology of law, and then went forward and completed that, and then just a few notes here on um, some terminology just to get us oriented into this field that we're about to study, and some of these terms um, may be ones you want to include in your glossary. That, that's, that's up to you. Um, and that's all. We will see you uh, 
see you uh, next time on, I think it's Tuesday the, uh, Tuesday the 8th. Thank you. So bring your questions, see if you have questions about Lesson 2, and we will uh, address those and um, possibly begin our, uh, begin our next lesson. Thanks very much.